Peace, Queen. First and foremost, I want to thank you for coming on the platform. It's definitely an honor. I truly appreciate you. Um, for the viewers who may not recognize you, let them know who you are and definitely where you're from. Okay, my name is Maria Howell. I'm an actor and a singer and voiceover artist. I am originally from North Carolina in the United States, of course. And here I am today. <laughs> Okay, okay. So now I got to ask you, growing up in North Carolina, who were some of your musical influences and when did you begin to sing? Um, I began singing at the age of 13 um, on the church choir. And a lot of my influences stem from Billie Holiday, Sarah Vaughan, of course, um, Nancy Wilson, of those classics. So uh, I have influences throughout those. So it's not just one anymore. Um, most people would know me as a singer from the movie, The Color Purple, the original uh, movie. <laughs> and um, that was my first acting role as a singer on the choir. So that's where I started professionally. Wow. Okay. Okay. That's amazing. You know, for a lot of us, the church was the place where we went to our first concert or we got a chance to do our first performance. So that was a start for a lot of us. But unfortunately, a lot of us don't give it up. Um, you mentioned some icons. I want to ask you about, you know, Sarah Vaughn and uh, Billie Holiday. Now, were those musicians that your family kind of played around the house or did you kind of discover them on your own? No, I was listening to those at around the age of 13 or 14, 15. Um, just somehow things just kind of evolved. I heard these voices and I resonated um, or they resonated with me rather. But interesting, uh, the story behind Billie Holiday, she was my first, um, I guess, musical mentor, if you will, because she looked like my one of my grandmothers. Uh, that I thought that was my grandmother when I saw a picture of her. So I kind of just kind of latched on and then I started listening to her music and then I, you know, kept growing with her. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. That is so cool. I mean, Billie Holiday is just unimaginable how many people she's actually influenced. Um, now I can ask you about acting. Is that something that you got into at that time or did that come later on? Now, that was something later on, but like I said, The Color Purple, the original movie with Whoopi Goldberg and Oprah Winfrey and Danny Glover, that was my first official acting role and as the choir soloist. So that, yeah, I was an adult when that started. That's amazing for that to be your first film. I mean, you really started off strong. That's a undeniable classic. Now I can ask you about that. How did you go about getting that role? Did you have to go out to Hollywood? Did you have to audition or? Well, they actually filmed it in North Carolina. So it was a not that far of a jump to be able to do it. And, and someone suggested since they knew I love to sing and potentially act that I try out for it. So I did. And out of a whole lot of people, I was I was blessed to have the the cast being cast in that role. Now, that's definitely a blessing. I wanted to ask you, were you already familiar with the story before you auditioned, or did you get a chance to read the book? Alice Walker wrote the book. I had no idea what the color purple was. I actually, it, everything was moving so fast um, that I actually read the book on the set. So I learned what the color purple meant as I was filming, which is an interesting <laughs> a backwards way, but it was an interesting way of learning about it. That's really, really cool. I mean, you having a hands-on experience with the film, and like you say, you getting to read the book on the set. Now I would like to ask you, what were your thoughts on the film Like after you got to sit down and watch it and see the final product? How did you feel about it? Well, my thoughts were I didn't realize how iconic it would turn out to be. Of course, when you're on set and you're hanging out with Steven Spielberg, Quincy Jones, um, Margaret Avery. I didn't really know who Oprah Winfrey was at the time, but th because this is before she became syndicated. Um, Richard Pryor's son was a PA on the set. So I knew who Richard Pryor was. Um, I also knew who Radon Chong was, who played Squeak. I knew all of these faces 
And Whoopi Goldberg, I definitely knew who she was uh, as a comedian. So that alone let me know you're in the midst of royalty. Gordon Parks was the still photographer. I mean, it was, there, there were a lot of people I was around, so I understood I was amongst royalty, but I had no idea how big the movie was going to be or how long and legendary it would uh, it would be. Man, you named so many icons. You know, some people was just getting their start and some people was already established. Now, I can ask you because I was born in 1985, so the film is almost 40 years old, but it has stood the test of time. And it's, it still holds weight in our community. Now, I want to ask you about the song. Uh, you say, God is trying to tell me something. It's a very impactful and spiritual song. Were you already familiar with that song? Or is that something that you had to learn as you auditioned for your part? I mean, it's a, it's a very telling song. I mean, the, the lyrics alone tell the story. Um, but it was not something I grew up listening to. I, I didn't know. I just thought it was another song. And then I learned it was a, um, you know, uh, Andre Crouch, who was an icon in the gospel world, had everything to do with that. So it was pretty, pretty heavy. <laughs> but the words still ring true now. I mean, it's the messages is, is just it's a never ending message. I really got to thank you again for your performance, because you know, me, myself, like a lot of other people, that's like our favorite part of the movie. I can remember growing up and watching that with my family. You know, we had to go to church every Sunday. So that's definitely one of the scenes that stood out for me. And I'm sure a lot of the viewers as well. Well, who knew? Who knew it was the climax of the movie? I mean, when we're filming it, I didn't know that because I was so green to the industry. That was my, like I said, my first experience. So I had no, I, I had nothing to compare it to. So. Okay, now I want to ask you about some of the other films that you've been involved in, because throughout your career, you have appeared in several classic films. Um, let me see. I'm going to try to list uh, just a few. Um, the The Hunger Games: Catching Fire is one. Um, I've got. Oh my gosh. Um, there have been quite. I've done a lot of TV. Um and several movies. I'm trying to think of movies themselves. Um, the What to Expect When You're Expecting. Um, um, I've just got one on Hallmark that is with Sky Marshall, who's amazing, and Tobias Trevillian. Um, though that's on Hallmark Mahogany. And I just finished a movie that will be coming out next year starring um, Diane Keaton and Kathy Bates, Alfre Woodard. So yes, a few, a few out there. <laughs> Those are definitely some classics. I mean, Hunger Games, that entire series, you know, is a box office smash. And also you was involved in uh, Hidden Figures, if you could talk about that. I love the film and the story. Um, of course, uh, it's a true story. So based on a true story. So it's always a beautiful experience to learn more about the history of something while you're filming it to be a part of that project. I knew filming it that it was going to be an amazing and important piece. So the not just being around the actors, but just the content and the message to be able to get that out there. And, and right after, a matter of fact, I think while I was still filming it, I remember feeling like, oh, there are gonna be so many other hidden figures, um, you know, hidden stories, if you will, that will be co coming to surface. And through that movie or because of it, I started talking with friends who had relatives, ancestors who had a part in that whole hidden figures um, era. So it was really, really um, eye-opening. It was ex it was an extremely eye-opening experience. Now I would like to know this: um, by you having experience in film and television, um, do you feel like it's a big difference between the two? 
And also, I would like to know, do you have a preference? Do you prefer to work in television or do you prefer to work in film or either? Well, both mediums are uh, slightly different, but then there are some TV shows that feel like every episode you're shooting a film. For example, I did a show on NBC called uh, The Revolution. And Giancarlo Esposito is in that as well. Um, filming that action felt like a movie every episode. So that was pretty big. And then there are some TV shows that are so much more contained where you're on a set in the sense of you don't have to move, but so far, you don't have to run down a road. You don't have to do any of that kind of stuff, you know? So <laughs> you don't have to shoot a gun, you know? <laughs> um, so it just depends on the, the project itself. It, it, you really can't say movies are one thing, TV is another thing because sometimes they cross um, the lines now for, for my experience. Okay, now um, you've done singing, you've done acting, uh, you've done voiceovers. Now I want to ask you, have you thought about writing and directing and producing your own projects? You know, it's interesting you should ask about writing and directing. I, I, I can collaborate. I don't have a big, big passion for writing. Um, directing, I think, I may somewhere along the line delve into that, but right now I just enjoy this particular process and this part that I play. I don't necessarily want to be on, I don't want to get too in everybody's lane. I, I know my lane <laughs> and my lane is just taking direction, delivering the, the delivering what you need. And I have, I have say so because I have uh, experience, but I don't have a, a deep passion for directing or writing. Okay, now that's a good point. Now, are you speaking in terms of teaching acting or singing or are you speaking just teaching in general? Well, I call it teaching because I teach whatever I know. I teach everything I know. I teach and do workshops um, with singing, acting and voiceover. Um, so everything that I know, I wanna pass it on. I think that's definitely important in terms of legacy to be able to work with individuals and give them something that they can use for the rest of their careers is very impactful. Now, I wanted to ask you, as an artist, do you have a preference in any specific genre, jazz, R&B? I have a wide variety of music that I like, um, but, but to sum it all up, I like things that are of quality. Um, quality content. And I mean, what I mean by that are things that are classic, things that will stand the test of time as opposed to something very faddish. Um, I believe in life lessons. I believe in self-reflection. I believe in enhancements. I believe in learning core values and, and virtuous, you know, living. I, I just believe in that. That's kind of all I've ever known. So even when I've made all my mistakes and still make mistakes, but I just like wisdom. I like songs with content that gives somebody something to really live by as opposed to it just feels good for now. You know, I like things that last and of quality. And that can, that can fall under several genres. That can fall under country. That can fall under classical. That can fall under pop. They can fall under anything. But jazz is my fave. <laughs> now in terms of music do you have anything online for the viewers in terms of you know spotify itunes or even youtube that they can go and check out and do you have any upcoming performances or you know projects in the work oh yeah they can go to, they can just google up my name um and maria howell and you can find the music it's on spotify it's on Apple. It's on all the, the platforms. I am currently, um, the music, my, my piano player and the band and I, we work a lot on jazz celebrations of different artists. For example, we've got a jazz celebration of Stevie Wonder, of Ray Charles, um, Chicago, the band, um, working on one for Hall and Oates. We have one for Elton John, Billy Joel. We've got all these different 
artists that we love. So we rearrange songs, um, put our flavor on them. And a matter of fact, there was there's one um, that we, uh, the Beatles, we believe it or not. It's beautiful. I love the selections. I love the arrangements. My pianist, uh, Noel Friedline, he's an arranger and amazing. So we have a great, great thing that we're doing right now. And we just finished a series of videos that we're going to be publishing so that um, we can take what we're doing worldwide. And we're looking forward to that. Okay, okay. Now I can ask you for the viewers, what is the name of the band? I have been with Noel Freeline that we call it NFQ. That's the Noel Freeline Quintet. Um, I've been with him 12 years now. 13, 12 or 13. Can't remember. When you're when you're having fun, it, it goes by kind of fast. <laughs> right, right. I want to thank you again, Queen, for coming on the platform. It has definitely been an honor. Um, I definitely look forward to, you know, everything that you have in the works, everything you have coming in the future, music, acting. Um, you know, you definitely been putting in some great work. I'm sure the viewers will as well. And next time I'm watching Color Purple with my family, I'm definitely going to have to brag on you. <laughs> okay, well, good. This is a fun fact right here. You can, you can tell your family that in the choir scene, in the church scene, when Suge Avery is bursting the doors of the church open and she's coming in and she's like, just, uh, and I'm up on the choir stand singing, they had to yell cut because all those people that were behind her were weighing the floor down and it was sinking. So they had this, they cut so they could rebuild the floor to make it stronger. <laughs> Cause that old church had no electricity. They took that church and moved it from one spot to another so it could have all that field around it. And there were, like I said, no electricity. So all the lights there were from the camera lights. It was actually raining outside at one point where they had to shine the big lights to make it look like it was sunny. So, and the last thing is when I was stepping down, when I was moving forward, because I'm, I'm petite, I was standing on an apple box. So when I stepped down, the step was not like this. It was like this. So it looks like I'm toddling and I'm about to fall because I was about to fall. <laughs> That's fun fact. <laughs> Ah, okay, okay. I'm definitely going to look for that next time I'm checking out the film. Uh, I know we probably will for the holidays. Um, I know the viewers will as well. You know, how you watch a movie, then you watch it again, and you catch different things. You know, you don't always catch them the first time. But that's real cool. I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you so much um, for coming on the platform again. I want to thank the viewers for tuning in. Uh, it's been another phenomenal episode of Taiye Speaks. So until next time, peace.